The following podcast is brought to you by Pro Wrestling Connect, Australia's newest choice for event management and brand development specialising in pro wrestling. And now, now the B Plus Wrestling Podcast. podcast. Watch, watch global. global. Support local. local. It's the B Plus Wrestling Podcast. It's the me. Hello, and welcome to the Wrestling Landscape Podcast. I am your host, Lance Larson. The Wrestling Landscape Podcast is the casual wrestling podcast, the informal wrestling podcast, and a member of the B+. Plus podcasting network and today i am drinking a coffee french press brewed hot and fresh because it's the afternoon time no alcohol for right now and i am uh, exhausted from the long weekend of wrestling and wrestling coverage that myself And Greg and everyone else, the B Plus Podcast Network, has been providing you on this huge SummerSlam weekend. If you want to call it that, you can call it G1 weekend if you want. Um, I personally covered Ring of Honor Summer Supercard, NXT TakeOver Toronto, uh, WWE SummerSlam, did a joint show with Greg on that, with a plethora of tangents, by the way. Um... And here I am doing my final episode for the Toronto um, weekend, I guess. So, it's tough because obviously the three shows I just mentioned happened in Toronto. Then these happened in Tokyo. So, it's just this whole weekend with a bunch of wrestling going on. I don't know what to label it because they're on two different sides of the world. But this this crazy-ass weekend that just happened. It's my last episode covering that weekend. And to be completely honest, probably take a few days off from recording after this. Because it was a hefty weekend watching all the wrestling and recording on all the wrestling. Which is fun, don't get me wrong, I love this, that's why I do it. But it's just after a crash course of a Friday through Monday covering all this. It's, uh, you need a break. You need a break. So, hoping to get to that AAA show from this weekend still. Which I heard was very good. I heard every match was very good. Which for AAA is incredibly uncommon. So I'm hoping to get to that, um, but that's the last show from uh, this past weekend that I intend to watch in the future, um, and that's, you know, might not get around to watching that till like Wednesday or Thursday or some shit, but, but that's not what this episode is about. This episode is about the final three nights of the G1 Climax 29 tournament. I decided um, to do all three nights in one episode. Because really what it came down to, there was, you know, going into the A block final night, you knew that only the last match was going to have implications for the finals. And going into the B block finale, like technically three matches did of the five. But I mean, we all, ultimately we all knew it was going to come down to Naito White. Um, and then obviously on the final night, usually, you know, the main events like the match and other stuff's there. Um, and there were certainly other stuff there this year. Oh boy. But, uh, you know, it's a, it's a one match show. So I thought it probably be best to just group them all together, which is what I did. So some matches I'll just, you know, glaze over with like two sentences and move on. But let's, uh, let's go through it. Let's talk about it. I took, uh, my notes on these shows as I was watching them. So it's funny that like, you know, I'd write something on, uh, the first night in Budokan. I'm like, oh, I wonder what's going to happen with this guy. And then, like, two nights later on the final, it's like, oh, that's what's happening with that guy. So, let's get into it. On the first two nights, we're doing tournament matches only. So, the last five matches from the first two nights in Budokan. Which, I saw a tweet. I did not fact-check it. Fact-check it. So, I guess, take it with a grain of salt. I saw a tweet saying that the total attendance for these three nights in Budokan is higher than last year's three total nights in attendance. Uh, the last two nights last year were sellouts. 
This year, that was not the case. So what made up the difference was a much stronger first night, which they had over 9,000, according to this tweet, this year, whereas last year they only had six. So that's that's the main reason, because the second two nights were down slightly. So overall, successful. I can imagine after two successful years running the Budokan three nights in a row for the G1, you got to think they're going to keep going back. I know Dave Meltzer has talked about how the Olympics next year might throw some of the venue stuff off. I've also heard contradicting reports saying that they're actually not using too many of the buildings that would throw off the G1 schedules in Tokyo. So it might not be too much of a difference next year. Or they might lean hard into it, you know, do a fucking, like, two G1 nights in America. They would do, like, two in Australia or some shit. Um... And come back and finish up in Japan or something. Who knows? Who knows? We will have to wait and see. But uh, if it doesn't conflict with the Olympics, you got to think they're coming back to Budokan again for the final three nights. Because, I mean, fuck, if you're making money, if you're putting 9000 on the first night and five digits on the second two nights, you're making money at Budokan. Like, there's no reason not to. But let's jump into the Niti Kriti. First tournament match on the final A-block night. From Saturday, August the 10th, Lance Archer defeated Evil, which was a good match. Uh, Lance Archer continues to work hard. I'm not entirely on the Lance Archer bandwagon train. Like, listen, obviously he's, this is the best Lance Archer I've ever seen. Obviously he's working very, very hard, but it's like, he's just, like, he's good. He's very good. And that's like, people are acting like he's fucking phenomenal. Like, he's very good. He's a really good mid-carder for New Japan coming out of this. That's how I see him. I want to see him challenge for the Never. Maybe even get a Never open weight reign. Challenge for the U.S. Maybe even get a U.S. title reign. That's as high as I want to see him go. Calm down, people. Just because he's working hard and he's shown improvement does not mean that he's something special. At least compared to the rest of this roster, because this roster is fucking stacked. He's very, very good. But please do not confuse very, very good with someone close to a main eventer. So, I thought this was an interesting result. Curious is a somewhat pushed commodity. Or, I'm sorry, Evil is a somewhat pushed commodity. He ate the pin to Archer here. wonder what that means for Evil going forward. I wonder what Archer's push will look like going forward after this. Um, and how high it'll go. Maybe they're just like, hey, thanks for working hard this tournament, and he doesn't actually get, you know, too many opportunities after this. Maybe they overpush him. Maybe they'll push him just like what I'm hoping for. Like I said, in the never open weight title picture, in the U.S. title picture. We'll have to wait and see. Next, we had Bad Luck Fale defeating Sonata. Shenanigans galore. Fale wins with a small package. So I believe that's at least three matches in the G1. He won with some kind of pinning wrestling combination. Um, either backslide or a small package, or I think a schoolboy may have been the third or whatever. But either way, rolling folks up, getting pins with the wrestling moves. I don't know what the story is there. I don't know what story they're starting to tell with that. I will wait and see on that one. I just, are they going to do a Follies becoming a wrestler gimmick? Like, that'll be a little bizarre. Now, listen, if I would love to be proven wrong on that, and he, like, works his ass off and comes out in the fall, like, for some reason, just this insane technical wrestler. That'd be the greatest thing ever. I'd fucking love that. I don't think that's going to happen. So I really don't know what story they're trying to tell with this. But it's New Japan. They have a lot of trust because they've um, paid off their storylines and have told good stories and they built up a lot of trust with their fan base with this stuff. So I'm willing to wait and see. Now, I saw some outrage on Twitter over Sonata dropping this one to Fale due to Fale's, you know, generally not, uh, not in the upper echelon of New Japan, if we can put it that way. And with Sonata presumably getting a title shot coming up this fall, we'll talk about that later. Why is he losing one to Fale? This, so, in the G1, I guess it doesn't strike me as that bad, just because, like, it's the G1, like, it happens, people lose to other people. So it didn't even cross my mind as, like, a, a, a knock on Sonata when this happened. But then I saw people talking about it on Twitter, and it made sense to me. I was like, okay, I get where you're coming from. But I don't, uh, I don't think it's that big a deal. So, but who knows, you know, in the grand scheme of things, with Sonata probably getting a title shot this fall, it, maybe it wasn't a smart move. 
Like, I think I side with him. I just don't know if that's the good deal. But I'm also curious to see what the story is with Fale. Very much have to wait and see that one. Next, we have Zack Sabre Jr. defeating Kenta. Um, probably good for Zack to get a win here. He needed it. And also played into, you know, the Kenta story later on. Probably. Um, this was a very, very, very good match. Really enjoyed it. Both were super vicious. And little naive Lance that I was, I wrote, what is Kenta's future? Under this match. Curious as to see where he'd go next after this G1. And uh, that was answered emphatically a couple nights later, as we'll talk about. So I'm glad Zach got the win. I think it was good for him because he was doing not a lot of winning this tournament. So ending with a strong win is always good. Next, we had Will Ospreay defeating Hiroshi Tanahashi. When this match ended, I was literally tearing up. It hit me that hard. So Tanahashi, in my humble opinion, is officially out of the Big Four in New Japan. The Big Four is officially Kota Ibushi, Kazuchika Okada, Tetsuya Naito, and Jay White. Tanahashi finishing the tournament four and five, putting over the junior heavyweight champion, and not being even involved in the last night's decisions that would decide the G1 finalists, are all the reasons why I think he's officially out of that main event group. Because think about it. In the A block, it came down to Ibushi and Okada. In the B block, it came down to Naito and White. Those are the big four now. Tanahashi doing it. It's not a torch passing moment. This isn't an ace to ace thing. That was a, that was Wrestle Kingdom ten. If you ask me, when Tanahashi lost to Okada. Um, but this was just the older vet leaving the main event scene, putting over a younger guy that's going to be in the main event scene in the next two years. Um, and you got to think, Os- Osprey is going to be in that elite main event group at some point in New Japan's future. I don't know when they'll see him ready to be there. I'm sure part of it is they would like him to put on a little more weight and probably, you know, shoot be 100 kilograms um, because I I think he's uh, uh, legitimately underneath that now. And so for him to be a heavyweight and be a heavyweight main eventer, I think they'd probably legitimately like him to be at that 100 kilograms. So putting words in their mouth, I don't know that for sure. It's just something I'm guesstimating on. So I, I view this as the exit of the main event scene for Roshi Tanahashi. Now, the way New Japan structures their tours... They have smaller matches and small, smaller titles made of any smaller shows. So obviously he's going to be in main events of shows in singles matches moving forward. It's not like he's never going to main event show again. That's not what I'm saying. But y'all know what I mean when I say he's not the big four anymore. The match itself was brilliant. Osprey is obviously unreal. Tanahashi is the smartest fucking man in wrestling. This match was beautiful. Absolutely perfect booking for both men. And a change of generations. Tanahashi's officially moving down and Osprey's officially moving up. So that is that is how I see this match. And probably my favorite match from these three nights at Budokan. I think I feel comfortable enough to say that. As I go on and talk about others, maybe I'll change my mind. But I really think Osprey Tanahashi is my favorite night of these trio of Budokan shows. So the main event of the A-Block finale was Kota Ibushi defeating Kazuchika Okada to win the A-Block. This was an awesome match. Don't get me wrong. I think I may... So I am certainly someone who probably has far too high expectations sometimes when it comes to New Japan main events. Where I see Ibushi versus Okada to decide the A-Block winner. And it's like in my head I'm just expecting a five-star match. So if something's four and a half, I feel a little underwhelmed, which is completely unfair to the competitors. Like, that's not... I shouldn't necessarily be expecting that. So, this match was very, very good. I think I had slightly too high expectations for it, which is why I felt slightly underwhelmed, but that is absolutely on me. I did take two Kamagoyas for Ibushi to get the win over Okada. So Okada, the ace, the champ, Obviously not going down easy. And 
Sonata and Ibushi were the only two with wins over Okada in the G1 tournament. So you would think Sonata would get a title challenge in the fall. And I was assuming Ibushi would get one as well. Because I was really thinking Naito was going to win the G1. And I was like, oh, well, that's fine. Ibushi will lose in the finals and I'll challenge Okada in the fall. That is not what happened, folks. B-block finale. Nippon Budokan in Tokyo, Japan. Saturday, August the 11th. Jeff Cobb defeated Toriyanu. It was fine. Taichi defeated Tomohiro Ishii. This was a fucking hot match. The crowd got so into this. Now, I'd have to go back, but I'm almost positive Taichi did nothing illegal in this match. Like, maybe some hair... Well, I, was, I was about to say maybe some hair pulling, but he doesn't have hair, so he didn't even do that. He wrestled as clean as a fucking whistle. Him and Ishii beat the shit out of each other, but Taichi just got the better of it and won. And walking out with Kanemaru on one side of him and Miho Abe on the other, feeling like a million bucks. Really interesting positioning of Taichi. Really enjoyed the match. I certainly like this Taichi. And, you know, uh, Kevin Kelly talks about it, and Rocky Romero talk about it, motivated Tai Chi is a dangerous Tai Chi. And so that's just kind of how they position his character. So this was a lot of fun. Kayfabe, this was certainly one of the nights where he was, quote-unquote, motivated. It's an awesome match. Uh, and they, they talked about this pretty heavily as well. Tai Chi is a former Never Champ, and he beat the current Never Champ, so it almost guarantees him a Never Openweight title opportunity. Shingo Takagi also defeated Ishii in the tournament. Um, and they listed the others that had be- beaten Ishii, and they were all champs of other belts. Like Naito, who's the IC champ, Moxley, who's the US champ, and Goto, who's in chaos, so he probably wouldn't challenge another chaos member for the belt. So they were very clearly positioning Shingo and Taichi as the next two challengers for the Never Open Weight title. And both of those title defenses will be awesome from Ishii. I think the Never Open Weight title is the perfect first belt for Shingo to challenge for outside of the junior belt. Which, he never actually did challenge for the junior belt, did he? Because he lost in the BOSJ finals. Wow. So yeah, this is the perfect belt for him. Um, quote unquote, making the transition from a junior to a heavyweight. So really look forward to that match because they're both awesome. And it just makes logical sense for Shingo. And hopefully Taichi and Ishii can have a good match again too. Next we had Juice Robinson defeating John Moxley. Which made all the sense in the world. Because Moxley got the big one over Robinson on his debut. So you had to think that here, what was this, a month and a half later. Robinson's getting his win back to set up that title challenge. This match was good. Not great. I enjoyed the first one more. But this very specifically uh, positioned Robinson to challenge for the U.S. belt. Especially because Moxley attacked him afterwards. Um, And so that was even solidified further on the next night. Which we'll talk about. Next, we had Shingo Takagi defeating Goto, which eliminated Goto from contention to win the B block. This was an awesome match, obviously. Both of these are very, very good. Shingo Takagi is as consistent as anyone in this fucking business with how cleanly he performs every single move, every single night. It is unreal. Shingo Takagi blows my fucking mind. So good, strong win for Shingo. As he is most likely challenging for that Never Open Weight title coming up. So getting him a big win over a former Never Champ before that happens is very smart. And it makes sense with the G1 booking so that the main event is just about the main event and just about the two men hoping to win the B block, which is Jay White and Tetsuya Naito. This was a great match, a lot of good work. Uh, both men had a neck psychology leading up to their finishers. So it was fun to watch that go back and forth. Um, but I'm not here to talk about the match, because it was very good. But I want to talk about the result. Jay White defeated Tetsuya Naito to win the B block and advance to the G1 Climax Finals. I 
was stunned. I was trying to hurry up and finish watching this match because I had to be somewhere and I was already running late. But, you know, I'm already, you know, 20 minutes into this fucking match. So I'm just going to, like, stop and watch the rest of the five minutes later. So I'm like, okay, come on, finish up, finish up, finish up. Jay White hits the Blade Runner and gets the one, two, three. And I just freeze. Could not believe what I saw. This goes against everything where I thought the company was going. So, when Tetsuya Naito challenged Kazuchika Okada for the IWGP Heavyweight Championship in the main event of Wrestle Kingdom at the Tokyo Dome a few years ago, I was sure Naito was winning then. Thought everything built up to that, and he lost. And that was actually when, when I learned one of the important lessons about following New Japan, they tell very long-term stories. And so a loss for someone here when you're expected to win usually means that something's coming down the pipeline. And so I was like, oh, okay. They're building up for something later on. Heard some other folks, uh, most notably the folks at the Super J cast, talk about how uh, Wrestle Kingdom in 2020 is the first Wrestle Kingdom of a new Emperor's era. It happens over a holiday weekend. And how that would be the perfect time for Tetsuya Naito to win the G1, challenge Okada for the belt, and finally redeem himself for the Wrestle Kingdom 8 debacle that his character is so based on. And so that's what I'd been expecting for, like, over a year. Is that since, like, sometime in the summer of last year, actually, no, probably less than a year, probably after the G1 sometime when Tetsuya Naito didn't win the G1 last year, um, and people were like, oh, why didn't he main event the Tokyo Dome, uh, for 2019? People were like, oh, it's because they're saving it for 2020. Big holiday weekend, first Wrestle Kingdom of the new Emperor era, it'll be huge. I was like, oh yeah, that makes sense, that makes sense. And then it didn't happen. He didn't win the G1 this year. Everywhere I thought this company was going, it's not. In the main event scene, at least. Now... We don't know the future for New Japan. They have built up a lot of goodwill for me in trusting their booking. And I almost always think when New Japan does something that I don't agree with, I almost always default to just wait and see. But this time, I don't know that there's anything to wait and see that'll make me feel better about it. Now, listen... I like Kota Ibushi more than I like Tetsuya Naito. Not gonna lie. But Naito's story is so fascinating and gripping that I wanted to see that payoff. I wanted to see him become the Shio Shioku, if only for one night. And we're not getting that. And you know what? Even if we do get it, if uh, Naito challenges Ibushi for the briefcase, wins the briefcase from Ibushi, that feels so hollow. Because Naito, if he's doing that, he's main eventing a double header Tokyo Dome. Should have just won the G1. Now, I don't think Ibushi's going to drop the briefcase. I do think we're getting Ibushi Okada. I'll talk on that later. So whatever Naito's doing, this Wrestle Kingdom, is going to be underwhelming. This was, in my opinion, the last time... To have a big Wrestle Kingdom moment for Tetsuya Naito. I think they have put it off for too long to where if it were to happen now, it would just feel hollow. Or diminished, at least. It would still feel great. Happened two, three years down the road. But greatly diminished. And would just feel like they missed the boat on it. If you were going to pull the trigger on Tetsuya Naito, having a legitimate, lengthy reign following up, crowning moment this was it Wrestle Kingdom 2020 was it now we don't know everything that happens backstage there have been rumors and whispers before of Tetsuya Naito being pretty run down in his body maybe there are some who are thinking he can't very soon he won't be able to go like he's been able to Maybe he's thinking retirement much earlier than some of us are thinking. And they just feel like, well, he's only got two more years left in him. 
Drought lets you use this opportunity to feature someone else. I don't know. That's just me speculating. That's based on rumors and whispers that I've heard and me extrapolating from there. So I'm not reporting anything. Don't think that's what's necessarily going on. These are just simply possibilities that I am pondering. Because I'm trying to think of a reason as to why the hell you would not give Naito this G1 win. But he lost to Jay White on the second night of the Trio of Budokan shows. I'm baffled. I'm still willing to wait and see for what New Japan does with it. But this time with the Grand Assault. It's time with the Grand Assault. Promotional consideration paid for by the following. Hey guys, just a reminder, if you want to hear all of these wonderful B-plus podcast episodes completely ad-free, make sure you head over to Patreon or Podbean, where we are the featured podcast this week. You can subscribe for as little as a dollar a month, up to $10 a month, where anything you want to help us with, it really helps out. It's going to help us grow the site. It's going to help us redesign some things. And everything that we get through this and through the advertising as well is all going straight back into the podcast so that we can get Aussie Graps out there for the rest of the world to hear about, for the rest of the world to see, so we can grow this mission of watch global, support local, and build indie wrestling. So if you want to be a part of that and get some really cool rewards like call-in shows, bonus episodes, ad-free like I mentioned, then head over to patreon.com slash the B plus and subscribe today. Hey everyone, just want to take a second to tell you about one of our new sponsors, Outbreak Nutrition. Outbreak Nutrition are creating supplements for survival, sharper minds, quicker reflexes, all the energy you need to take your performance to the next level, whether that be on the field, in the gym, on the gaming field. That's right, they have specifically designed gaming supplements as well to help you focus on those late night sessions. They even sell coffee, you guys, at Outbreak Nutrition. You can get coffee pods, you can get coffee beans, you can get supplements for the bedroom as well if you want to enhance your performance there. These are performance enhancing supplements for every aspect of your life, specifically designed by gamers for gamers to stay fit and healthy in the gym, to stay sharp and focused on the game, and to dominate in all areas of life. So check out OutbreakNutrition.com. And for being a listener of our podcast, they will give you 10% off your order when you enter the code B+. That is B-P-L-U-S at checkout. So make sure if you want to stay on top of your game, if you want to take your performance to the next level, OutbreakNutrition.com. Enter the code B+, at checkout. Let's move on to the final night in Budokan. One match show. The rest is the undercard tags. So uh, I'm going to talk about the top three matches in detail. Everything else is just the undercard. It was fine. Nothing sucked, but nothing was great. Big two uh, stories come out of the undercard was in the opening match. It was Young Lions versus Young Lions. Uh, two from the LA Dojo versus two from the traditional New Japan Dojo in Tokyo. And they set it up like it was kind of a feud between the LA guys and the Tokyo guys. LA guys won, and after the match, some more young lions from both sides came out. You know, were shoving each other. Maybe throwing a forearm or two. A little bit of heat between the two dojos. That's interesting. That's fun. I, I don't know what they're doing with that. But that's curious to me. Makes me far more interested in the Young Lion openers than I have ever have been. <laughs> For the first time in my life, I actually considered watching the Young Lions Cup. <laughs> so, so I guess in that sense, it's, uh, it's doing its job. So that was fun. The other big story, I guess not big, is that uh, Mox and Juice were further in their feud. They were on opposite sides of a tag match. Uh, Mox talked to him afterwards, put him through a table. They are very clearly setting up a U.S. title rematch. So that could not be any more clear. If anyone had any doubts in their head, I don't think anyone did. But this was just like, okay, yep, they're definitely doing that. I don't know if that'll be a Royal Quest. I don't know if that'll be at Destruction. I don't know if they'll put that all the way off to King of Pro Wrestling. I'm sure a lot of that will depend on Mox's schedule. And if slash how long he'll be with New Japan. Is he just working through October? How many dates will he take after AEW starts TV? His defense against Juice, I'm sure, will tell us quite a bit. 
So those, that was the big stuff coming out of the undercard, third from the top. We had Tomohiro Ishii, Yoshihashi, and Kenta going against Bad Luck Fale and G.O.D. This match was going along just fine. Tomohiro Ishii was making the comeback after the heat segment. Went to go make the hot tag to Kenta, who had yet to tag in for the entire match. And Kenta jumped down from the apron and refused to tag in. Let Bullet Club beat on, beat on them a little more. Once Ishii started making another comeback, Kenta slides in, hits a big fucking knee on Ishii, hits the go to sleep, and Bullet Club gets the win due to Kenta, who had turned his cloak and had officially joined Bullet Club in that swift move. Is it because he underperformed in the G1? Felt like he needed uh, some cronies? Not even cronies, some teammates? Some backup? I don't know, but nonetheless, he joined a bullet club. Which is a huge shift in power for them. Kent is a big get. But then that piece of news, which would normally be a very talkable point, was instantly overshadowed by the much more important and much bigger news of Katsuyori Shibata getting involved in his first physical angle since his head injury. Shibata, presumably infuriated that his friend, the man he brought back into New Japan, had done something so dastardly and dishonorable that this motherfucker comes out in a t-shirt and gym shorts and instantly starts pounding on Kenta. Didn't even wait for a crowd pop. Didn't wait for the crowd to be like, oh shit, that's Shibata, what's he doing here? He slid right in and started fucking up Kenta. It was great. It was perfect Shibata. This motherfucker doesn't give a fuck about the fans. He's pissed at Kenta. So he gets involved. He's kicking ass. He's looking motherfucking great. The crowd is going ape shit. And so the biggest question coming out of this, because Bullet Club obviously ganged up and subdued Shibata, and Kenta did the Shibata uh, cross-legged sit-down folded arms pose on top of Shibata's chest. And so it seems to everyone that they are building a Shibata-Kenta feud. Which would be fucking nuts! Now... I watched this show about 10 hours late, so the Shibata thing was spoiled for me, sadly. But I haven't looked up any of the reports, so I don't know if there's an official report out there yet saying Shibata's definitely back, or how soon, or whatever the fuck. So I'm still just going off speculation here. But that was clearly what they were building, and I can only assume that Kenta Shibata is going to be a huge match in one of the Dome shows, because they got a 40,000-seat arena that they want to sell out two nights in a row. And one of the ways to fucking do that is to have Kenta versus Shibata. Especially after this hot ass angle. It's fucking great. Absolutely fucking great. I hope Shibata is full, is back full time. I hope he's ready to fucking go. I also, now, I don't think this is how New Japan will do it, but I would love to see him not work a match until the dome. I think I would prefer that. Drag it out. Keep them apart. Don't even have them on opposite sides of tag matches. I want Shibata's first return match to be in the Dome. Keep that newness as fresh as possible. Sell some extra tickets. Sell the Dome out two nights in a row. I want to see that happen. I want to see that happen. So that's fucking crazy. Saw some tweets talking about Shibata going after the whole Bullet Club. I don't know if he's going to do that. I think it might just be Kenta specifically. I hope that match happens. I hope it's at the Dome. Even if it doesn't, it's going to be fucking nuts. In the semi-main, we had Minoru Suzuki and Zack Sabre Jr. defeating Hiroshi Tanahashi and Kazuchika Okada. This was a fun match. But the news coming out of it is that Minoru Suzuki pinned Kazuchika Okada with the Gotch-style pile driver. So Suzuki has a pin over the current champ, 
presumably to set up a defense for the fall. Furthermore, based on this match and some other tweets I saw, can't tell I get half my wrestling news from Twitter, it also looks like Tanahashi and Zack Sabre Jr. will have a match for the Rev Pro Heavyweight title. I would assume that would take place at Royal Quest on August 31st in London. But the big news is Suzuki Okada, and it looks like they are positioning the guys to challenge for Okada in the fall, which is very clearly Sonata. He uh, won the pin for the LAJ match earlier in the night, and Suzuki, obviously. And I thought for sure, I shouldn't say for sure, I was thinking Obushi would lose in the finals, and he would be the third challenger, and oh, they'd have one for Royal Quest, they'd have one for Destruction, they'd have one for King of Pro Wrestling, so that worked out perfectly. But, it's not what happened. Kota Ibushi defeated Jay White to win the G1 Climax 29. Now, before I talk about the match, do you want to talk about what that means for the future challenges for Okada? So, Ibushi beat Okada in the tournament. So, if he had lost the finals, he probably would have challenged him in the fall. That's not what happened. So, now it looks like we only have two challengers, Sonata and Suzuki. And we know there's going to be a title defense in the Destruction Tour. We know there's going to be a title defense on King of Pro Wrestling. I'm not sure if there's going to be a title defense on Royal Quest, and there's usually not a title defense on Power Struggle in November. So either this means there's not a title defense on Royal Quest, which I think would make the most sense, or they're going to have to make a new challenger on Royal Quest for a future challenge, and maybe can challenge Okada right after Royal Quest. Those are the two scenarios. I think the most likely is that there is no title defense on Royal Quest. And Okada will only have two defenses for the rest of 2019. And then we'll head, head into his main event match at the Tokyo Dome with Kota Ibushi. Who earned that spot by defeating Jay White in 31 minutes. Thought this was a very good match. I went four and three quarters on it. Really, really enjoyed it. Um, Jay White was very Jay White in it. Now... Ibushi beat Okada, and I'm kind of stealing this from John Carroll a little bit, so I want to uh, I want to give that Twitter account a shout out. But do we really want to see a rematch of this at the Dome? Like we already saw Ibushi beat Okada. Is that really the main event of like the biggest weekend for New Japan in like fucking forever? That seems underwhelming. Why would they be in the same block? If that's the main event you had in mind, why are they in the same block? That feels so bizarre to me. So there's something in the back of my head that tells me they're going to pull something weird. I don't know if Ibushi's going to challenge early, and they'll have to have a new challenger at the Dome. Like, that seems incredibly unlikely. But I'm just trying to think of a reason as to why they do a rematch from the B block final, or from, excuse me, from the A block finals. Why would they, they be in the same block if that's the match you have in mind? Why not just not have them touch in the G1? So I don't know if I'm missing something. Or if they're going to do something wacky in the late summer or fall or early winter. The whole thing just feels a little underwhelming for me. Don't get me wrong, that match is going to be fucking insane. It's Okada and Ibushi at the Dome. They're just going to pull out everything they possibly can to have an absolutely incredible match. So maybe I shouldn't say it's underwhelming. But it just didn't have the pizzazz or the investment that I felt like the Naito Challenge would have had. Especially if he went into that as the IC Champion and walked out with both belts. Completely redeeming himself of Wrestle Kingdom 8. Maybe you feel very differently. But I, anything other than Naito just felt like the wrong choice. So maybe I just need time to get over it. Because I know Ibushi and Okada are going to have a lights out match in January. So I really shouldn't call it underwhelming at all. Overall, this was an incredible G1. thought it was awesomely consistent. There was never, I watched every single tournament match. There was never a time where I'm watching, you know, the five tournament matches from any given night and I'm bored. Never happened. Enjoyed it. It was great. Absolutely thumbs up. Honestly, I think it kind of spoiled me because it set my expectations so high for pro wrestling that I'm watching anything else and I'm like, oh, four stars. That's boring. So I almost felt like it spoiled me. 
congrats to everyone in New Japan, a part of this incredible G1. It was amazing. Um, I am exhausted from wrestling because of the G1, but in a good way. The Super J Cup is coming up. That's New Japan's next tour. Those are not airing live. There will be a delay. I don't know if it'll just be a couple days. I don't know if it'll be like fucking weeks. But depending on when those finally hit New Japan World, the next New Japan show that we know for sure is happening is August 31st in London, the Royal Quest show, which is going to kick off a very long day for pro wrestling fans, as that happens in the morning U.S. time. Um, and then the afternoon U.S. time is the NXT UK TakeOver Cardiff show, and then that evening is AEW All Out. So probably 12 hours straight of pro wrestling on that day, at least for me. This has been your final G1 review of 2019 from the Wrestling Land Tape Podcast. I hope you enjoyed these. I enjoyed watching it. I enjoyed talking about it. Enjoyed drinking my coffee, sipping my whiskey while I was doing it. Thank you so much for listening and take care.